I would like to welcome you to the T-Bio 572 Laboratory on Breast Cancer. Now this pre-lab talk consists of two videos. In the first video, I will give you a description of the anatomy of the breast and a brief overview of breast cancer. And in the second video, I will discuss the individual slides in this laboratory and identify the structures you should recognize. The learning objectives of this laboratory are that by the end, you should be able to recognize the normal architecture of the breast, be able to distinguish it from ductal carcinoma in situ, and finally be able to identify invasive ductal carcinoma. This slide lists some of the important aspects of breast cancer which you should be aware of. First, it is the most common form of cancer in women. Indeed, about 9% of women in the United States will develop breast cancer at some point during their lifetime. Now, even though breast cancer is a most prevalent form of cancer in women, it ranks second with regard to cancer mortality in women from age 35 to 54. The reason for this is that lung cancer, while less prevalent than breast cancer, is far, far more lethal. Breast cancer can metastasize to the lungs, the brain, or to the bone, and in so doing can compromise the function of these organs. And this is a major cause of death. Of those initially diagnosed with metastatic disease, the average lifespan is about two years. And finally, early detection by mammography or biopsies and early treatment have significantly reduced the mortality rate. This diagram shows the gross anatomy of the human breast. It is essentially organized around six to ten major ductal systems that are embedded in a matrix of collagen and adipose tissue. You can think of each of these systems as being in the form of a branching tree, with the trunks converging at the nipple. I will now list the structures of the ductal system as it starts at the nipple and travels towards the secretory portion. First, close to the nipple, there is a swelling in each of the ducts termed lactiferous sinus. Further away from the nipple, this narrows down to form the lactiferous duct. After this, the duct begins to branch into smaller segmental ducts. These segmental ducts finally lead to the terminal ducts that end in a structure termed the terminal duct lobular unit. Now, the figure in the inset is a little misleading. It shows a structure labeled a terminal ductal lobular unit as being oval in shape. In actual fact, it is shaped more like a bunch of grapes. Indeed, it is described by the term acinus, which comes from the Latin word meaning grape-like. This is a low power view of an H&E stained section of the normal breast. Most of the section consists of collagenous connective tissue here labeled interlobule stroma, stroma being the structural or connective tissue portion of an organ. The terminal ductal lobular unit, here labeled simply lobule, contains the terminal ducts and the secretory units. You should note that the collagen within the lobule, here labeled intralobule stroma, stains slightly lighter than the interlobular stroma. This is a higher power view of a lobule showing the ducts and glands. As I indicated previously, it is shaped much like a bunch of grapes, and each individual spherical structure is termed an acinus. At this magnification, you can see that the normal breast acinus is lined by a layer of lobular cells. You can tell this by the fact that the nuclei are just one layer thick. Also note the presence of myoepithelial cells at the base of the lobular cells. These cells have flattened nuclei and are located just above the basement membrane. These myoepithelial cells have contractile properties and are important for diagnosing carcinomas. The absence of myoepithelial cells is indicative of a carcinoma. At present, the stem cell theory concerning the origins of breast cancer is widely accepted. This theory postulates that abnormalities in the development of the stem cells 
gives rise to cancer. Now, stem cells have the capacity of self-renewal. That is, when a stem cell divides, one of the daughter cells gives rise to a copy of itself, while the other daughter cell can undergo terminal differentiation. In the case of the breast, these stem cells are believed to be located near the junction of the terminal duct and the glands. In the case of the breast, the final result of this differentiation can be either a ductal cell or a lobular cell. Approximately 80% of breast cancers arise from the ductal lineage, whereas about 10% are from the lobular lineage. In this laboratory, you will be examining only ductal carcinomas. However, you should be aware of the fact that lobular carcinomas also exist. Now, as illustrated in this chart, there are two major categories of breast lesions, fibrocystic changes and proliferative breast disease. The first category, fibrocystic changes, may cause discomfort but are not particularly serious. These include cysts, which are dilations of the duct due to a blockage, fibrosis, which is an abnormal increase in the connective tissue, perhaps due to inflammation, and finally adenosis, which is an increase in the number of glandular cells. Of course, this occurs naturally during pregnancy in preparation for lactation but it can also occur sporadically in the non-lactating breast. The second category of proliferative breast disease is of greater concern. This represents a spectrum of conditions ranging from usual ductal hyperplasia to invasive carcinoma. It is these conditions that will be addressed in this laboratory. Under proliferative breast disease, the first condition is usual ductal hyperplasia. This is a common situation that is reversible and not indicative of an increased risk of cancer. This condition simply represents an expansion of the ductal cell population. However, these cells are morphologically normal. On the other hand, if the ductal cells show signs of dysplasia, then the condition is termed atypical hyperplasia and this is a more serious condition than usual hyperplasia. In this situation, the ductal epithelial cells are not morphologically normal. Before I show you slides of hyperplasia, I'm going to show you this slide of a normal ductal lobular unit so you can better appreciate the difference. Note that the terminal duct shown here is one to two cell layers thick. You can tell this by looking at the location of the nuclei, since you cannot really see the cell boundaries under HNE staining. This next slide shows examples of usual and atypical ductal hyperplasia. In both cases, you can see that the ductal epithelium is multilayered and fills most of the lumen. In the case of usual ductal hyperplasia, shown on the left, you can observe a variety of cell shapes and sizes based upon the nuclear staining. It is a confused mixture of both ductal epithelial cells at various stages of differentiation and myoepithelial cells. These cells are morphologically normal. In contrast, the example of atypical hyperplasia shown in the right panel, the cells are much more uniform in shape and size based upon the shape of their nuclei. This suggests that the ductal cells have lost some of their normal developmental program. Please note that it is often difficult to distinguish between atypical hyperplasia and ductal carcinoma in situ, which I will discuss next. Atypical hyperplasia may progress into carcinoma. Remember that this can be either ductal or lobular in nature. The first step in this process is termed carcinoma in situ, which translates to carcinoma in place. This means that the tumor cells are confined to the ducts. They have not made the critical step of passing through the basement membrane of the ductal epithelium. Technically, this is a benign condition, but it is still clinically treated as a carcinoma that has not metastasized. Removal followed by radiation often cures this condition. This slide shows what ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, 
looks like under the microscope. You can see a normal duct on the upper left-hand corner with just one layer of epithelial cells. In contrast, the two ducts labeled DCIS are highly dilated and completely filled with cells. When you look at these cells, you will note that they are very homogeneous. The nuclei are larger than those of the normal duct and lighter staining. This represents a monoclonal proliferation of the epithelial cells. There is also a lack of myoepithelial cells, but this is difficult to tell with just HNE staining. Also in this slide, note a region that is a dark blue. This is a region of calcification. It is hard and often shatters during sectioning. The cells in this region have died out and have been replaced by proteins that bind calcium. This turns out to be an important factor in the diagnosis of breast cancer. One of the things that radiologists look at on mammograms is regions of microcalcifications. These regions are considered to be suspicious and justify further examination by biopsy. The final stage in this tumor progression is invasive carcinoma, in which the tumor cells have made the important step of invading through the basement membrane of the ductal epithelium. This is a microscopic view of invasive ductal carcinoma. This is considered to be moderately well differentiated in that the cancer cells on the left side are still trying to form tubules, as you can see by the small lumens. However, the morphology is completely different from that of a normal lobular unit. On the right side, you can see how the tumor cells have converged to form a large continuous mass that contains multiple lumens. Now at this point, I recommend that you continue on to the next video in which I go through the individual slides that you should observe in this laboratory.